guys, it's Kate from Air and Space and welcome to Antiques Deep Dive Part 5. So today we are going to discuss uh, one of my favorite things to collect, which is antique weather vanes. So, weather vanes. Um, the origin of the word, uh, it actually started as an old English word, uh, fane, F-A-N-E. And a fane was a fabric banner, kind of a heraldic banner that would be carried into battle. Uh, representing whatever kingdom or clan uh, was fighting. They were often then put on top of castles, turrets, buildings um, to represent that clan or kingdom. And because fabric tends to wear very quickly in the weather, they were replaced with uh, metal uh, fanes or veins, uh, which would represent, you know, banners and things like that. Um, now, we don't really know when people started using weather vanes to indicate the direction of the wind, but we can assume that they were relying on something, some sort of uh, type of that, basically as long as people have been sailing and uh, relying on the weather um, to uh, farm. So we know that one of the earliest weather vanes uh, recorded was on the top of the Tower of Wind, which was in Greece, and it was in the form of the god Triton. Uh, and that was in 48 BC. So obviously there is a very, very long history of weather vanes being used. Um, by the 16th and 17th century in Europe and the UK, they were being used more and more commonly on buildings. Um, one of the most common forms is the cockerel or rooster, as we typically call it now. And one of the reasons that the rooster is one of the most common forms of weather vane used, which I'm just gonna kind of put that so you can see that's a very typical form, um, was because in the ninth, ninth century, there was a papal decree that all religious buildings had to have a cockerel weather vane or a weather cock, as they were called at the time, uh, on top. And that was to represent the betray betrayal of, um, uh, Peter's betrayal of Jesus uh, which I don't really know a lot about religion, but that, that is what I know is the rooster represented that. By the 17th and 18th century, the rooster really didn't have that much of the, the religious connotation that it did um, much earlier. So in America, we know that there were weather vanes on buildings in the 17th century, which is of course the first um, time when we have a lot of European colonists building up buildings in, in the United States and in, in America. Um, there are very few surviving examples of 17th century American made veins and all of them date to the last quarter of the 17th century. Uh, most of them are iron. Uh, there probably were wooden ones that were made, but of course wood survives much less than uh, metal elements do in the weather and these were exposed to the weather. Um, one of the most famous 18th century weather vane makers was a fella named Shem Drown when he was born in 1683 in Kittery, Maine. And by 1692, we know that he's living in Boston. Uh, and he was a, a fine craftsman of metals, uh, and including weather vanes, and created some of the most important and amazing weather vanes that are even now still on buildings. Um, his best known weather vane and probably the most famous weather vane in America is one that he made in 1742 of a giant grasshopper which sits atop Faneuil Hall in Boston. Uh, and still to this day, he's got several weather vanes that are still on buildings in Boston to this day, which is just an absolutely incredible uh, legacy. And he passed away in 1774. Um, just after the colonial revolution, we see a big surge in very patriotic weather vanes because there's a whole, you know, amazing diversity of subject matters that veins cover. Um, a good example would be uh, the weather vane that George Washington commissioned to have put on top of uh, Mount Vernon was in the form of a dove to represent this newfound peace that we had found as the United States after the war. Um, other patriotic elements you see are eagles and um, the goddess Liberty, um, various kinds of Americana, things like that. Um, weather vanes in terms of subject matter also would represent either the career or hobby of, of the person that was living on the property. And really by the last quarter of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, they were very common on many homes and many businesses, um, both for the purpose of, you know, displaying um, the direction of the wind, which people still needed to know, but also to, to, to um, represent the... Um, you know, the, the, the pride that the homeowner had in their property. I think it appealed to the egalitarian sense of, 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 the, of the new um, United States. 
to you know your own kingdom and so you would have your own banner and that would be say if you were a sea captain it could be a codfish or a sailing ship um, or if you were a lawyer it might be a quill or a shoe if you were a boot maker um, so uh, we see just an incredible variation on forms and there's also a lot of variation in the level of skill that the people making weather vanes uh, demonstrated so there are very very um, homemade efforts even in the 18th and early 19th century people who were making them themselves either out of wood or iron or material materials they had laying around um, and often those are extremely charming if naive um, and um, really unique kind of beautiful examples of folk art um, and then there were others that were being made by highly skilled craftspersons like like Deacon Shem Brown Drown um, so with the Industrial Revolution, which um, this is a drum that I'm going to beat a lot and a lot of these uh, deep dives is that um, the Industrial Revolution really changed the way that uh, material culture was created in our country. So um, we really see this change from people, individual craftsmen making these on a one by one basis to them being mass produced. Um, so again, I'm going to bring my little rooster over here. This is not a 19th century weather vane. This is a 20th century weather vane, but it's a pretty good visual example of what we see from the 19th century veins. Um, again, all different subject matters and you could either order, um, your weather vane from a catalog, or if you had a lot of money to burn, you could commission a custom one, but they would of course have to make a mold. Um, and some of the, um, major manufacturers, uh, AJ Jewel and, uh, JW Fisk. Uh, J. Howard. Um, there were probably three or four dozen manufacturers making these on different levels post-Civil War. Um, and really from about 1875 to 1900 was like the heyday of those weather vanes. Um, most weather vanes manufactured in that way are made in a, in a two-part two mold. The copper would be hammered into the mold um, and then it would be um, soldered with lead, which that's what this is right here. This is a very sloppy example. And uh, a good way to judge the, the um, difference between a 20th century weather vane and a 19th century weather vane is that the 19th century ones were very detailed, beautifully, so they would take them out of the mold and then they would chase them to make even more detail so the feathers would really show, you know, this tail would have all these incredible feathers too. Um, and by the 20th century, they're just kind of banging these out in a, in a machine. Um, so um, when we look at collecting weather vanes, and I do enjoy collecting them. Uh, I don't have the finances to get really, really good ones. Weather, good weather vanes can be extremely valuable. Um, some examples of some very valuable weather vanes that have sold over the years. Um, a uh, horse and rider weather vane sold at Sotheby's in 1990. Um, and it was made by uh, J. Howard, which is one of the major manufacturers in the late 19th century. Um, it was a rare form, great surface, and it brought, I believe, seven hundred and seventy thousand uh, dollars another example of a valuable vein that's sold recently um, Skinner's sold one in 2010 of a quote-unquote touring car which was kind of an early open form of car um, it had been made in 1910 and it brought um, nine hundred and forty one thousand dollars so just under a million dollars which really gives you a sense of the the very top shelf veins really can bring absolutely incredible uh, prices and it actually um, because they became popular as a collect you know something that you would collect rather than just being this object that you would put on the outside of your house but as you know recognized as a piece of sculpture really in like just between the first and second quarter of the 20th century people started bringing the earlier veins into their homes and appreciating them as sculpture um, and the touring car what was interesting about it and um, kind of leads us to our next topic with the weather veins. It had a really intact surface, um, and when we're examining the value of a weather vane, surface is just so important. Um, and the reason its surface had, was so intact was that it was brought in, um, I think in the 1950s or 60s, it was brought inside so it didn't weather over the course of 100 or 150 years. Um, so when we talk about surface with weather vanes, I think, um, and I'm just going to bring up another example here so you can see this is a sweet little weather vane I got um, at the flea market. Oh, probably eight years ago, and I think I paid fifteen dollars for it, which was a good a good buy because weather vanes are, are quite valuable. Um, but this is a very simple form, which is one of the reasons it was so cheap. Um, so what I want to talk about is this color, this beautiful kind of teal, soft, like almost a chalky surface, and that's called verdigris. And verdigris is uh, the surface that we get when copper ages. Um, it's 
it's a, a patina is the other word that we would use. Um, and so I'm going to also show you, this is a modern weather vane. This is a banner weather vane, which is one of the forms that we commonly see. And so again, this harkens back to that heraldic form of the earliest veins that we would see on um, castles. And um, this has never been outside. Um, it was probably always made just to be an indoor decorative piece. And that's why the copper is still the color we recognize as copper. It hasn't got really any verdigris at all. Whereas, whereas this was outside and so has this beautiful color. But there's actually a step with the antique veins between uh, bright copper and the verdigris that we most uh, typically associate with veins, and that would be gilding. So in the 19th and early 20th century, um, these copper veins would not just be copper and be put outside. Um, the owners wanted them to be flashy. They'd spent a lot of money on them. I mean, the prices in the catalogs could vary from like $650, which was a lot of money back then, to say $300, which was a fortune back then. So this was a very valuable piece of your architectural appearance of your structure. Um, and so what they would do is they would coat this with a yellow paint that was called sizing, which essentially was like priming the copper, and then they would gold leaf it. It was gilt. And so you can picture how spectacular these bright gold um, weather vanes would be up in the light, catching it as they spun. Um, and then over time, eventually that gilding would wear off and the sizing would wear off. So when you're looking at a very early weather vane, um, a good indicator that it is an actual antique is that you can still see uh, remnants of the sizing and sometimes the gilding. And of course, that touring car that, that brought $941,000 had most of its gilding still, which was really incredible. Um, and when you're looking at where you want to see that, it's going to be in the places that are protected from the weather. So down in these kind of safe spots where if you're thinking about the rain coming down and streaking down, these would be the last places where that surface would wear away. Now this, this vein, this rooster, which I got in Maine, um, uh, a while ago, probably 10 years ago, and I think it was like $95. Um, this is from probably the 1930s or 40s, and I suspect it was never even gilt because by then they were really being mass produced and people just, everyone was putting them on their barns. Um, and nobody really bothers to, to gild their weather vanes these days either because it's expensive. Um, and because people really like the verdigris surface. So obviously gilding is ideal when you're looking at an antique weather vane, but it's extremely rare because of course they were in the weather. Um, so this verdigris is a very desirable surface. The other thing you typically see with uh, early weather vanes is that they might have bullet holes in them because kids would use them at target practice. Um, and surprisingly, that doesn't greatly impact the value of a vein if it's got a few bullet holes in it. Um, so weather vanes do occasionally get faked um, just because they are so valuable. Um, so you can get catalogs of um, the early weather vane manufacturers and hopefully identify your vein based on form because they were pretty specific to the makers in the 19th century. Um, and of course it never hurts to buy your weather vane from a reputable dealer um, and hopefully with a provenance because provenance really helps to establish that your weather vane is authentic. Um, and this is my only weather vane that's got kind of an interesting provenance. Um, and this, when I purchased it at the flea market, was actually still attached to the fence post that it had been on in front of a house in Union, Connecticut. Um, so we know that it's authentic, though it's probably from, you know, 1900 to 1925, so it's not early and the form is not rare, but it does, it does tell me that it is an original antique weather vane versus, of course, this great big copper banner, um, which is a reproduction. Um, so certainly it's an accessible place. You can start with smaller veins like I have in my collection and later versions like the rooster, um, or even here's a little piece of a weather vane. So this is of course the arrow that would have spun on top of the directional and, um, these you can find fairly frequently. This would have been, um, 1930s, 1940s, and really just this, this, the very simplest, most basic of, of weather vane forms. Um, and also I have here, this I got from a house in East Hampton, Connecticut a long time ago. Um, this is, I don't know if you can see the whole thing here, but this is the directionals of the weather vane. Um, so originally this copper ball sits up here and originally there would have been some sculptural vein like this sitting on here, but that's long gone because that was the most valuable part. And now we just have kind of the, the raw iron directional and two copper balls. And I actually have this in my garden typically. Um, so, you know, you can, you can start with things like this. Um, when you're looking at a good 19th century weather vein, 
Um, really, they're going to be in the thousands just about always unless they have something wrong with them. And you should be highly suspicious of a weather vane that's, say, like this rooster or a horse that's being um, presented as being a 19th century vane and is less than $1,000 because um, frequently they, they, they still hold a lot of value in the antiques market. Um, so thanks so much for tuning in. I hope this one I'll be able to do a follow-up on weather vanes um, down the road when I have access to um, some slightly better, um, more important vanes so we can see a little bit better the detail and the quality of a good 19th century vane so you can understand why they garner so much uh, money. Um, please like, share, and subscribe. Tell your friends. And if you have any questions, let me know.